Thank you very much uh, to the organizers. Um, this paper uh, fits extremely well with the last paper. I think we're pretty much uh, on the same page when it comes to endogenous money creation of the banking system. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Zoltan Jakob from the International Monetary Fund, my former colleague. Uh, the usual disclaimer applies for both the International Monetary Fund and the Bank of England. So by way of introduction, uh, following the, the crisis uh, in the central banking space, models of banking can and should play a role in supporting monetary and macrofinancial policy analysis, and that's certainly the case uh, at all the central banks. What I will argue today is that the recent models use what I'm calling the intermediation of loanable funds theory of banking. I made that term up, but you will find those words in a lot of model descriptions out there. And I will argue that this theory misrepresents how credit is created in the real world. Um, the solution that I will propose here is uh, what I call is to use what I call the financing through money creation theory um, of banking, uh, which I will argue is uh, more consistent with the actual credit creation process. Um, and it is consistent with two papers that came out in 2014 in the Bank of England quarterly bulletin before I joined the Bank of England by uh, three of my now colleagues. Uh, that is really uh, an excellent description of the money and credit creation process in a modern banking system. And when I talked to John Vickers uh, about this about half a year ago, he said when he teaches uh, money and banking, he normally uses some textbook. But when it comes to the actual money creation process, he puts that aside and uses these papers from the Bank of England uh, to talk about it. And you can think of the paper and the theoretical frame that uh, work that I'm going to present here today as a, a way to formalize the insights that are in those Bank of England papers. So uh, I used to immediately launch into what I think are some misconceptions about banks out there in the literature and also in the policy debate. Um, but uh, it, it actually turns out to be more useful to say, what do I actually do? What do we actually do in the model? Uh, and how does that relate to models that we already know? Um, and I grew up with models of money that actually still had money in them. Um, and uh, these were uh, re typically representative household models, the Drowski Brock models, whatever, uh, with either cash in advance, money in the utility or transaction cost technology, and exogenous government money entered those technologies or utility functions. And the argument that we're ma making here today is that there may be problems with both of these things, but the bigger problem is with two, not with one. The exogenous government money in the United Kingdom, for example, accounts for precisely 3% of the overall money supply, M4. Uh, the other 97% are thereby left out of the model. And what we are going to do is to replace the 3% entirely uh, and only put the 97% uh, into a transaction cost technology and in that case, it actually turns out to be crucial, although it may not be the only way, but that's the way we found, is to work with a representative household assumption who simultaneously borrows and holds deposits. Now, there's a, why, why would the household do that? It would do that because um, there's a benefit to holding liquidity. This is similar to the previous paper. Uh, the cost is the spread, uh, the spread that he or she has to pay in order to have the bank create this liquidity for him or her. Um, so the, uh, the household would borrow at, say, 5% and then hold deposits at 3%, paying the 2% spread, but he or she does that because the, of the liquidity that the bank thereby generates. So the bank in this model does not play the role of an intermediary so much as it plays the role of a manufacturer of liquidity. So now into a little more detail about banks. I will argue banks are not intermediaries of loanable funds and also that the deposit multiplier theory is a myth. It seems like to some extent I'm preaching to the converted here, uh, but this is, uh, this is my presentation that I always give on this talk and believe me, the converted are a minority. Um, banks are not intermediaries of loanable funds um, and so this is a bit of a dense slide but I try to squeeze everything onto one slide. Uh, the loanable funds model is the first major bullet, and then the financing model uh, that I will argue for is the second one. Uh, the credit uh, process in the loanable funds model is one of intermediation, which essentially is the physical trading of real resources. Uh, many of these models that are out in the literature, including the ones that I use for microfinancial policy analysis, are real models. They are not monetary at all. And what happens there is that banks collect a, de a deposit of real resources from a saver, 
and lend those existing goods to another agent, which is the borrower. You can therefore think in this model as deposits as an input, um, deposits in loans out. Uh, money in this model is held exclusively, or you, you don't even need to call it money, deposits What is what I should say. Deposits are held as a store of value. And if you want to explain rapid changes in credit, such as we observe in the real world in this model, uh, you need some sort of switching of savings model. Um, I will get to that uh, later on. So households can either hold their savings via the banking system or directly. The financing model, financing is the digital creation of monetary purchasing power. It has nothing to do per se with real resources. When banks make a loan to an agent X, they create new money for that agent X and credit it to, uh, to his or her deposit account that same instant. Um, in this model, in a sense, deposits are an output because they are produced via borrowing in order to create a service that is essential to the agent. Money in this model is held as a medium of exchange, and rapid changes in this model, uh, changes in credit in this model, can be explained through changes in gross balance sheet positions in the banking system. And as, a, as we will see when we look at some data, that is actually the major reason why we have these big fluctuations in bank balance sheet. Um, and uh, let me emphasize that what is on this slide is not a theory that I now need to collect data to prove. This is a fact. Um, and, and, you know, any modern description of the credit process, and if you, if you ask any central banker who is familiar with this process, uh, this should not be controversial, but surprisingly very often it is. And so uh, in, in, in many uh, models and papers, you will see descriptions of what happens uh, through banks that are sort of similar to what's in this top slide. We have a bank balance sheet in the middle, there's a saver, dumps something into the bank, the bank then passes it on to some investor. Uh, none of this has anything to do with money, it's purely real, uh, and the investor basically has to barter in order to get what he ultimately wants. The story that we're advocating is that the, for banks, not for non-bank financial institutions, but for banks, the arrows point the other way, logically speaking. Of course, in a, in a temporal sense, this is all simultaneous, but logically speaking, it starts with somebody, one person, approaching the bank, getting a loan of money, that same person getting a deposit of money, and then using that deposit of money to, do, to engage in monetary exchange to acquire what he or she came to the bank uh, for. Um, now, these models behave very differently because in the loanable funds model, in the pure version, deposits come from a physical process of saving resources, which is a slow process unless you assume some pro, uh, linear preferences, for example, which is an extreme assumption. We don't do that in this model. But then saving resources is also an ext can be an extremely uh, fast and, and discontinuous process. If you have curvature and preferences, it is not. Uh, in the financing model, uh, deposits are created uh, on a computer as book entries, and this can be instantaneous, discontinuous. And what constrains this process is not savings, very many models talk about savings and how they are channeled through banks. Savings do not constrain what banks do. Reserves also do not constrain what banks do during normal times. Uh, the paper that we just saw um, is, is, is valuable during, you know, especially during unusual times such as we have recently experienced, but during normal times when a central bank targets interest rates, reserves are endogenous and are not a constraint. Um, and the only thing that does constrain this process is bank and borrower optimality conditions. The bank solves the problem, credit supply is the outcome. The borrower solves the problem, credit demand is the outcome. The only thing that affects the quantity of credit that ultimately prevails in equilibrium is whatever enters these optimality conditions, which includes regulation. But it's not like some quantity of saving could actually uh, fix or determine the quantity of credit. Finally, the deposit multiplier is a myth. Um, uh, this is the story that the central bank fixes narrow aggregates and then broad money is a function of that by being relent. Um, Killen and Prescott showed that this doesn't work uh, with the data during the um, uh, 70s and 80s period in the United States because broad money leads the cycle, narrow money lags the cycle. Uh, when you do inflation targeting, this obviously has to be true because if you control a price, then you have to let uh, the quantities, reserves, adjust. Again, uh, unusual circumstances such as recent ones uh, uh, excluded from that, from that line of argumentation. Okay, so when it comes to banks, the, the conclusion is the transmission uh, 
when something happens in the financial sphere, it starts with loan creation, which equals deposit creation and is, entails deposit creation, and ends with reserve creation. Here's a quote from Alan Holmes, at the time Vice President of New York Federal Reserve. In the real world, banks extend credit, creating deposits in the process, and look for the reserves later. So in some sense, if you look at many, many undergraduate textbooks, that, that chain of three elements goes exactly the other way around from, it, from what it typically does in many of those textbooks, not all of them, but many. So now, uh, again, because uh, time is relatively short, um, I am going to uh, just describe briefly what's in our model. Um, so and uh, banks um, provide credit. They do not lend out loanable funds. In fact, I want to make this very, very clear, and again, the nice thing here is I appear to be partly preaching to the converted. There are no loanable funds. Um, uh, f the funds, and I've done this, I, w I lent money for five years at Barclays Bank in the UK, uh, and, and when you sit in front of your borrower, you don't look whether you have loanable funds. Those funds are in your mind, and they materialize on your keyboard along with the loan when you decide to lend. You manufacture that money uh, at that moment. Uh, bank liabilities, uh, household bank demand deposits, and we're assuming uh, um, not a quantity equation here, but a schmidt grohe ribe transactions cost technology, uh, and bank deposits here are not real savings. They are created uh, as money and uh, valued in their function as money. Um, and again, I want to emphasize, because this is a very common statement in the literature, uh, that banks collect deposits from non-banks. From non in the aggregate sense, they do not. They create deposits for non-banks, and there's a world of difference in that, as I will show you in the simulations. Uh, bank equity is subject to Basel regulation in the model and subject to aggregate risk. Uh, bank assets, uh, banks are lenders. They don't hold assets directly, which is also uh, quite important. Um, and the loan contract is a Bananke Gilchrist type loan contract, but lending rates are non-contingent, so banks have to lock in lending rates before they know the state of the economy, which means that they can pick the, uh, pick the wrong rate, make losses, and therefore need capital adequacy and capital buffers in order to protect themselves. Um, I will present in the simulations uh, two models. One is a loanable funds and one is a financing model. Um, the, the models are completely identical except for that one difference, and I will show you on the next slide what that difference actually boils down to. There are new Keynesian monetary models, such as everybody uses in the, in the central banking space to analyze regulation. Uh, identical preferences, identical technologies, identical endowments, identical deterministic steady states. So these models do not differ, differ in steady state, but they differ enormously in, in the dynamics. Okay. Uh, where do they differ? What's the difference in the structure? Um, model one, which is a, a typical loanable funds model, you have a saver household and a borrower household, and for the saver household, um, the change in his deposits is equal to his income minus his spending, or her. This is a real budget constraint, uh, and uh, as long as my income and spending, um, uh, you know, my technology and my preferences have some, have some curvature in them, you cannot suddenly overnight double your stock of deposits, which means that the way it's going to look in the model, deposits are predetermined variables. Um, in the borrower is basically the flip side of that. He, he gets in that model, he gets his loans out the other side of the bank balance sheet, and again, his budget constraint um, has the same uh, feature, and therefore his loans are his, uh, also a predetermined variable. The key difference, once you introduce a financing model, you basically collapse these two budget constraints into one, work with the representative household, as I, as I discussed uh, on, the, on the second slide of the presentation. And then what you have, abstract from capital, because capital is itself a slow-moving process with uh, investment adjustment cost, et cetera. So then you have the change in deposits minus the change in loans is equal to income minus spending. So that means irrespective of what's happening with my income and my spending, if I need more deposits, I get more loans. I make those two terms on the left-hand side go up together or down together in a crash, and it, I don't need to have any real savings or dis-savings in order to make those two items move. And the bank will do this. If I find this profitable and the bank finds it profitable, it will be done. That's where the difference is between the models. Now, uh, a brief impulse response, and then some, uh, some stylized facts. It's, again, a bit of a dense slide here. Um, this is an impulse response for a, 
uh, Cristiano Motto Rostagno style risk shock, i.e. a shock to the distribution of the riskiness of corporate borrowers. And on the axis, I have 16 quarters on the horizontal axis. The dashed line is a loanable funds model and the solid line is a financing model. In the right column, I have mainly financial variables. In the left column, I have the real variables. And I start my discussion in the right column. So what happens is that the bank suddenly finds that risk has increased. It therefore finds that it has set its lending rate in the past at too low a value to compensate for that risk. It makes losses. If you look at bank net worth uh, at the bottom here, it makes losses. Um, and it uh, now needs to, first of all, rebuild its equity because it's subject to Basel regulation. And it also needs to compensate itself for the higher risk of its borrowers. If you're in the loanable funds world, you can't do very much on the quantity side of your balance sheet because your deposits are a slow moving variable and, and, and consequently uh, so are your loans. Um, and so all your action is on the quantity side. You jack up the spread in order to compensate yourself for the higher risk of your borrowers. In this particular example, it goes up by 200 basis points on impact. If you're a financing bank, as we have in the real world, then you look at the same situation and you say, look, I can choose a combination of quantity and price to respond to this quite freely because I'm not constrained by some sort of quantity of saving on the liability side of my balance sheet. And therefore, you see here, I contract my deposits and my loans together by 5% in this single quarter. And that means that the loan to value ratios of my remaining, of my remaining borrowers are now lower which means that that counteracts the higher risk, and I can get away with charging a spread that is still higher, but not as high as in a loanable funds model, because I have also adjusted on the quantity side. And so uh, the spread, therefore, only increases by about half as much. Uh, a little side issue. Uh, in the data, we observe pro-cyclical book value leverage. Uh, in our model, in the financing model, that actually happens, because there is a contraction in net worth in both models. But here in this model, it is very simple for the banks to adjust their leverage very, very quickly, to adjust their assets and liabilities very, very quickly, and in this case, by even more than the contraction in net worth, so that the leverage in this downturn actually decreases pro-cyclical leverage. Okay? On the real side, the link between these financial and real things is what I call the effective prices of consumption and investment, meaning the real purchasing price plus the transaction costs that are necessary in order to conduct my purchases. And similar to the liquidity function that we saw in the last paper, <laughs> when the banks suddenly contract the mass of circulating medium in the economy, this makes all transactions harder to conduct uh, because people have a harder time getting their hands on, on liquidity. That drives up the price of consumption and investment Therefore, if you, if you look at the real effects in this financing model, of course, this is only an example. We're estimating models like this right now. But here, the real effect is roughly uh, twice as large uh, as in the loanable funds model. And it's also, in this model, much easier to uh, generate a positive co-movement of consumption and investment, um, which, which ha is harder in the loanable funds model. So, that's, that's it in a nutshell and just for one shock. I don't have time for more. I want to briefly look at stylized facts. Um, these models generate three interrelated empirical style or stylized facts level predictions. One is that credit and money exhibit large and discontinuous jumps. Uh, the other is that bank leverage is pro-cyclical or uh, perhaps acyclical. And then three credit crashes have a large quantity rationing component. There is literature empirical and otherwise on all of these. Um, two and three, I don't have time to cover, but I'm going to cover one. Um, here we have time series evidence for six countries uh, produced in a similar way to Adrian, Koller, and Shin, um, that paper, uh, which looks at, which plots the change in the log of bank assets against the change in the log of bank equity, which are the blue dots and the change in the log of, uh, of debt. And these are time series data for national banking systems. And you see, similar to what uh, Adrian et al. had in their paper, there is not a very strong relationship with equity, but a close to a straight line relationship between debt and assets. They will move virtually one for one. Now, there are other ways to try and generate this in a model. But obviously, our model does that. I mean, that, 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 that's a natural consequence. 
of, um, of our model because debt is actually created through, uh, through loans uh, very directly. Um, also note that these balance sheet changes are often extremely large, so you, need, you actually need model. If you have quantitative models to talk about regulation, you need to be able to reproduce that. You're talking about national banking system in a single quarter often having fluctuations in the balance sheet side, and this is taking out interbank transactions and valuation effects of four or five percent. It's not uncommon. Um, here we have for the United States, Eurozone, France and Germany at the bottom, the names are cut off. Uh, we have uh, cha changes in bank debt versus net private saving. The blue lines are changes in bank debt uh, uh, quarter on quarter. Uh, and the, uh, um, the red lines are net private saving ratio. Uh, up there is actually the green line is the net private saving ratio. You can see that bank balance sheets are extremely volatile. They grow at ex totally different rates from saving. They are completely disconnected from saving. So having a, a theory of banking that is all based on saving uh, leads you, in my view, uh, down the wrong path. And in fact, if you see what happened to saving in the, in the financial crisis in the United States, it went up. So a model, it, 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 you would have to conclude from that, oh, the banks must have intermediated more saving in the crisis, which of course didn't happen at all. Um, I have one or two more slides. Um, bank financing and bond financing in the United States. Here you see, and I, let's focus just on the crisis, the contraction in balance sheets um, um, of banks. The, the, this, this turquoise line is the complete, uh, the complete banking system, i.e. lending to households, lending to firms, etc. There was a huge contraction, and there are many papers out there that say, well, perhaps this was an alternative channel where households decided instead of channeling their savings through the banking system, they channeled them through markets, i.e. bond markets or equity markets. Here are the data for the bond market. There was a little bit of an uptick in bond market for, for, the, for the bluest of blue chip firms who could do so at that time, but it's tiny compared to what happens in credit markets. And if you look a little bit deeper, uh, this is just the corporate financing part of that to completely crash, and this is in, this is in millions of dollars, right? it completely crashed. Uh, there was a little bit of an offset there, less than half, far, far less than half, from equity issuance uh, and, and, and issuance of corporate bonds. So was this households? No, it wasn't households at all. This is the contribution of households to this. Um, actually, the, the households bought a little more equity uh, there at the time of the crisis, but their, their, the, the non-financial business liabilities to households, i.e. non-equity uh, positions, actually decreased. The net was almost zero. So to have a theory where households have a certain pot of savings, and then in a crisis they decide to take some of that outside banks and instead hold it direct, it's just not there. Right? Instead, what happened is that this co contraction in the red line is a change in gross positions. Banks contract assets and liabilities together. And if you go outside corporates who can issue bonds and equity, if you go to household lending, it's not even clear what the alternative would be. Going to the bond market, going to the equity market, doesn't make any sense, right? Um, so the conclusions. In, the th in theory, I have put one possible candidate out here uh, for an alternative to a loanable funds model. Um, um, and there may be others. I'm working with various people on, on, on various endogenous money models right now. Um, we just saw the model comparison uh, in that they, they, they predict very different things for the behavior of quantities and prices. We saw the stylized facts. I just want to briefly look ahead. There is a very large, this is the last slide, there's a very large literature studying the quantitative effects of macroprudential policies. Um, almost the entire literature so far uses a loanable funds model of banking. And um, we, uh, I think that a lot of this could benefit from Running, them th running it through this type of model and reevaluating it, especially for macroprudential policy. If you see you know, how quickly a banking system can turn around and suddenly des uh, decide to pump up credit uh, without being constrained by savings, this tells you something about how you should use your macroprudential instruments um, uh, that, that is potentially quite different from the alternative model family. And at the Bank of England, we have just started uh, doing that. It's, it's a huge agenda. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, thanks a lot for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to discuss this paper. So 
Let me just start by summarizing this paper. I, I think that the sort of the big question being asked is sort of what's the role of the financial sector? What's the role of uh, money creation in uh, DSG models? Um, and what the paper does, it proposes this idea of FMC banks, or as they call it, financing through money creation, uh, explains what that concept is, uh, has a lot of real world examples of why they think that's the relevant way to think about banks, uh, and then takes that idea and puts it into a standard DSG model and tries to see you know, what are the things we can learn from that, what are moments potentially we can match, which we typically don't look at or we don't uh, we are not able to match uh, in, in the standard models. Um, here's the three main findings. Uh, first of all, if you put in uh, this concept of uh, the FMC bank of money creation, you allow for large jumps in credit and money. Um, that's interesting. It's almost a bit by construction because it's constrained otherwise. Uh, but it's important if, you, if, if, if those are things you want to match. Um, second, uh, it creates pro-cyclical uh, bank leverage uh, as opposed to the standard models, which they argue uh, create counter-cyclical leverage. Uh, that's an important point that we'll come back to. And then uh, it also looks like there's more, sort of more quantity rationing of credit as opposed to uh, price rationing. So overall, I think it's very clear that this paper asks an interesting, uh, important, very topical question. Uh, in some sense, uh, and that's sort of the perspective I'm coming from, there is already a very large literature on trying to understand financial intermediation, but that's mostly in microeconomics. I mean, a few classical papers, uh, Diamond Dipwick on bank runs, Diamond on delegated uh, monitoring, Gordon Benacci on why we have deposits. Uh, so there is a vibrant literature, uh, which is not cited in uh, the current draft of the paper, and I think it would be uh, important to bring some of these things in. Uh, but clearly, if you go to macro, most macro models um, either ignore financial intermediation altogether, uh, or if they do model financial intermediation, it's usually through a financial friction. Uh, and in macro now, there's sort of a re-evaluation of this, uh, trying to understand, well, maybe we should bring back banks or bring them into these models and see whether uh, that helps us uh, to do better policy analysis. Um, in my discussion, I want to uh, sort of talk uh, about three things. First, I want to sort of get back to this idea of financing for money creation, this FMC model. Um, uh, then I want to talk a little bit, a few facts on uh, money creation uh, on, on deposits. And, and in the end, I'm going to come back to sort of what are the advantages of having this FMC model uh, in a DSG model. Uh, so first of all, uh, if you think about the FMC model, I think it's always good to start with sort of what's the efficient benchmark. Uh, I think the efficient benchmark is a model where you have two agents. Uh, you can think of one as the entrepreneur, the other one is the lender. The entrepreneur is the smart one. Uh, they have a great technology, but they have no resources. Uh, the lender has the resources. Uh, he doesn't have the technology. He's not as smart. So what do you want to do? You want to have a bank effectively going to arrange a loan from the lender to uh, the entrepreneur. What the entrepreneur is going to do, he's going to invest it wisely. Uh, and at the end of the day, he's going to return principal plus interest back to the lender. Now, uh, banks may be important in arranging these loans, but if they work efficiently, uh, there seem to be an institutional detail which can be safely ignored. Right? Uh, now, the, the macro models with financial frictions, uh, and you know, the idea is you know, somewhere the efficient benchmark breaks down. Uh, you know, often there's an agency problem. Uh, you know, suppose the entrepreneur can run away with the loan. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of Bernanke Gürtler. Uh, so then you want that the entrepreneur has some skin in the game. Okay? If you need to have some skin in the game, that's endogenous is going to generate a net worth constraint. The amount you can borrow is going to depend on the bank's net worth. Uh, and that creates a role for the entrepreneur's net worth. Uh, the net worth is going to uh, determine how much uh, an entrepreneur can invest, and so that creates persistence, amplification of shocks today. If you have a productivity shock, and you get a financial accelerator. Now, if you think about a bank in this framework, uh, a bank here is really just a financial friction, uh, but the bank still just arranges a loan from the from the lender to the entrepreneur, uh, but there's no role beyond it. It just has to respect this net worth uh, constraint. Okay? So uh, do these models capture financial intermediaries, banks as we know them, as we see them in the real world? And this paper uh, says no. Uh, and I think they're right. This, this is not how we think about uh, banks. 
Now, I should point out, uh, they're not alone in saying this. I think other people in macro say it as well. This is a quote uh, from a handbook chapter of monetary economics by uh, Gertler and Kiyotaki, and they say, well, much of the earlier macroeconomics literature with financial frictions emphasize credit market constraints and non-financial borrowers. Really, what they're trying to do is sort of matching the external finance premium, uh, but they sort of ignored the financial intermediation sector. Okay? So I think there's a consensus that we don't have it in this model. Um, but now the question is, what's missing? What, what, what are the elements of banks we want to put into the models which we, we, which we don't have there? Okay? So there's agreement we don't have it, but what's, what's going to go in? Okay? Now, um, I think the paper has sort of a, a, a longer description uh, of what are the things they want to put in. Uh, and there's actually a bunch of things. Uh, there's sort of a list uh, at some point in the paper. I think these are sort of key elements uh, which I think the authors want to convey. Uh, first of all, uh, as came through in the, uh, in the presentations, you know, it's about creating monetary reliability. So deposits play a central role. Uh, and household value deposits uh, for various reasons, including the fact that they can use them for transaction purposes. Uh, but it's also the idea that uh, banks' net worth is endogenous determined by banks maximizing, uh, and that has effects on how much they want to lend. Uh, there's also a discussion that bank equity is costly, or at least perceived as costly by the banks, and hard to issue, especially during times of crisis. And then uh, uh, relating to what's going on in the regulatory framework, we know that there's new regulation, uh, both at the micro level uh, and also macroprudential regulation, which potentially uh, can constrain lending. Okay? Now, my comment number one is um, I'm, I'm a little bit struggling sort of uh, um, on, on sort of to think what's the right friction, what's the right model of a bank uh, which we want to put uh, into the DSG models. Okay, so right now, and I will have more to say on that, I think the key point is sort of uh, about deposits and money creation. I think that's, that's a very sensible way to go, and I completely agree with that. Uh, but there's also a number of other uh, elements, uh, the non-contingent lending rates, there's this like, regulatory requirements which seem to be important, there's equity issuance costs, and they're sort of motivated by the fact that that's what we see in the real world. Okay? The, the issue there is, I think, you know, once you start of thinking about what we see in the real world, uh, and also sort of looking at the micro literature on financial intermediation, there are a couple of other things you could potentially put in. Uh, so, you know, you know, bank runs clearly have been important during the financial crisis. Uh, there is the too big to fail problem, moral hazard associated with it. There's government insurance for deposits. The explicit and explicit, uh, implicit and explicit uh, government guarantees. Uh, there's the function of delegated monitoring. So there's sort of a large number of things we might want to put in the mall. And right now, it's for me at least, it's a little bit of a black box uh, trying to understand exactly what are sort of the elements uh, which they argue sort of important to put in. Okay? So I think what would be helpful is to sort of focus on adding one main new element. Uh, maybe you need more if it's about the interaction of those, but I think that, that would clarify it somewhat. Um, and I think that the one they want to focus on is the role of money creation, uh, and, and that's why I sort of want to discuss this uh, next. So uh, how do they think about deposits in the paper? So they, they, there's various examples uh, and descriptions, uh, most of which I completely agree. Okay? So in that sense, I think I'm one of the converted. Uh, so one of the things to say, well, depositing a check does not create loans. Okay? So as they rightly point out, if you deposit a check, you don't change the aggregate amount of bank deposits. Um, they say loans become before deposits. I think that's true in terms of an accounting identity. Um, they have an example in the paper. I mean, once you give a loan and uh, the borrower wants to take out the deposit, the bank still has to think about how they are funding it. Uh, so they may actually have to pay, you know, to, to uh, reduce the reserves and so on. But uh, clearly, if you want to lend uh, as an accounting identity, you can just create deposits at the same time. Deposits create their own reserves. I mean, there's a long discussion to what extent uh, reserve requirements are truly binding. Uh, as a matter of fact, even before the crisis, a lot of deposits were not covered by reserve requirements anymore in the US. So uh, I agree with them that reserve requirements are probably less important than they uh, still are you know, in the textbooks. Uh, deposit multiplier has been refuted. Uh, it's clear during the crisis that didn't work, so I agree with that. And, and then they put in, uh, in the model, they sort of say retail deposit banks have market power. Um, you know, I have some work on that. I, don't, you know, I, I actually agree with it, although some people may, may find it controversial. Okay? But I think what's important is you know, sort of being clear on, uh, even though all these statements are true, is sort of trying to think, well, do these things matter in the aggregate? Once we aggregate up, uh, does it change how we think about uh, uh, the real economy? 
And let me show you some um, aggregate facts, uh, facts you can actually get from the flow of funds, uh, in order to support the argument that deposits are large uh, and important, okay? So one thing uh, I wanna point out is that the cost of deposits can be quite substantial, okay? Uh, and that changes with policy, it actually changes with the stance of monetary policy, okay? So this is a graph which shows you basically the Fed funds rate and various deposit rates. In black, you have the Fed funds rate. Uh, and uh, uh, it basically, probably the best one to, concentrate, to focus on is the red line. That's the deposit rate on savings deposits. Uh, I can't cut it off before the financial crisis, you know, since the Fed funds rate and all the deposit rates are close to zero. If you wanted to extend it, you would just see uh, a bunch of zero uh, if you looked at the financial crisis. Uh, the point is, uh, there is a substantial spread, something which also came up in the previous paper. Uh, so if you look at the difference between the red line and the black line, that's the opportunity cost of holding a deposit relative to investing in the safe assets, which yield something close to the Fed funds rate. Okay? And what's interesting, uh, and that's sort of consistent with equation number one in the paper, uh, when they talk about the pricing of retail deposits, that spread varies with the level of the Fed funds rate. So when the Fed funds rate is low, that spread is very low. Okay? The opportunity cost of holding a deposit relative to investing at the Fed funds rate, for example, for a money market fund, uh, there's, not, there's really no opportunity cost. Uh, they both yield the same. Um, versus if uh, the Fed funds rate is high, there is a high spread. And that spread for savings deposits, which is the main source of deposits, that's why I focus on it, uh, you can go to 400, 500 basis points, okay? So it can get very large. Um, so in that sense, you have large changes in prices. Uh, when you have large changes in prices in the opportunity cost of falling deposits, you may think that, you know, maybe there's also changes in quantities. Okay? So a lot of people think deposits are sticky, but if you just go to the flow of funds and look at, you know, I'm focusing again on savings deposits, so these are 6.5 trillion, two-thirds of deposits in the U.S., uh, if you look at what happens with the growth of savings deposits uh, and correlate with changes in the Fed funds rate, and that's what I'm doing here. So you look at year-on-year -year changes in the Fed funds rate and year-on-year -year changes, uh, the growth in savings deposits, you see a very large negative correlation. Okay? So anytime uh, the Fed funds rate goes up, uh, deposits flow out of savings, uh, so savings deposits uh, decline. Uh, and uh, vice versa, when the Fed funds rate comes down, you see inflows into savings deposits. And these flows are large, uh, consistent with the model, uh, of the FMC model, uh, it has an average growth of 6%, but you see large variation on the order of 18% uh, around that. And these are year-on-year -year changes, so they can really change uh, the size of bank balance sheets. Um, now, uh, the paper argues in order to get these, so that bunch of possible explanations here. This is just sort of uh, univariate correlations. Uh, but uh, one way to get this is to sort of think about the market power of banks. And the idea is that the market power of banks is larger if uh, monetary policy is tight. Uh, why would that be? Uh, it's because the outside good, uh, which also provides liquidity, cash or non-interest paying checking accounts, becomes more expensive uh, when the Fed funds rate is high because for those accounts, the opportunity cost of holding assets uh, as cash or currency or non-interest checking uh, is basically, that is the Fed funds rate. Uh, so that means banks have more market power when the monetary policy is tight. And, and one way uh, to look at that, and I've done this in work with, with Corfus at NYU, is sort of looking at what's the transmission of changes in the Fed funds rate uh, uh, depending on how competitive local deposit markets are. Uh, and I just wanna show you this one graph. Basically what you see is if, if markets are uncompetitive, um, those are to the right, and basically banks are able to increase the spreads, increase the price of deposits more when the Fed funds rate uh, goes up, and, and if the markets are, uh, um, are uh, competitive, then they, they can't do as much. And, and the reason I put that up is because uh, in some sense, uh, that's exactly what's being uh, assumed in the model, so uh, it's very much consistent uh, with the idea of the FMC model, okay? Now, my comment number two is, uh, I would take it even further, okay? So I think one potential criticism of this is to say, okay, well, you see that there are large changes in the provision of deposits, but banks can just substitute the other sources of funding. So if the Mulligan and Miller theorem for banks holds, well, they may go out to wholesale funding markets, uh, it's not really gonna affect their lending, okay? So you need something else um, in order to have an effect on the real economy, uh, that's usually the idea that deposits are special. That's, that's an old assumption. It's, it's assumed 
when you think about the bank lending channel. Why are they special? Well, uh, from the bank's perspective, it's because they're less prone to runs. Uh, so uh, as such, they're hard to replace by wholesale funding. Then what you get is basically sort of a standard bank lending channel uh, through the market power over the creation of deposits, which doesn't rely on reserves. Okay, so that's one thing which potentially one could put into a model. It's also important for households. Uh, so deposits are arguably a main source of liquidity for households. So if there's a large change in the supply of liquid assets to households, it affects the pricing of liquid assets. Okay? And we do see that the liquidity premium, uh, and you can measure this various ways. One came up early in the discussion. You look at Fed's funds versus T-bills. You, you see that if you measure the liquidity premium, it highly correlates with uh, the Fed funds rate. And so potentially these deposits are potentially changing the quantity of deposits are the reason why you see these changes in the liquidity premium, which in turn uh, can affect uh, how much leverage banks are willing to take on uh, and the cost of capital. In particular, if you think that banks have to hold liquidity to insure themselves uh, against funding shocks. Okay? So the comment here is basically, I completely agree with putting the deposits in there. In some sense, I want to have more in the deposits. I want to make them special and then see how that uh, affects uh, real outcomes. Okay. Uh, and then the, the, my last point is sort of on, on the results coming out of the model. Um, so uh, the, the office sort of emphasized that bank leverage tends to be pro-cyclical in the FMC model, but counter-cyclical in the traditional, which I would call the financial friction model. Uh, and they also mentioned uh, this paper by uh, Adrian and co-authors who showed that there's a strong co-movement between changes in assets and debt. Okay? Uh, and I just want to sort of point out that there is still an ongoing debate in the literature uh, I'm trying to understand to what extent uh, financial sector leverage is pro-cyclical versus counter-cyclical, where usually uh, this is not necessarily with respect to real variables, but sort of just looking with respect to when the asset side uh, goes up, uh, does leverage increase uh, or decrease? So some people use pro-cyclical, counter-cyclical in different, in different ways. Um, but I want to point out, I think, uh, and this is a point which has been made by, I think, uh, empirically first by, by Adrian and Shin is, you know, you definitely see for broker leverage, uh, you do see that leverage uh, uh, declined during the financial crisis. And this is just one graph to show you that. That's sort of this blue line. Uh, and that's sort of consistent with a VAR constraint, okay? You can only uh, hold, uh, to have a certain amount of leverage given the volatility uh, of the underlying assets. It's something which also comes up in Brunmeyer Peterson, uh, and there's also another model by Adrian and Shin. Uh, and we do see similar results for hedge funds, which uh, you know, have to uh, respect a, a similar type of constraint. Okay? Uh, but there's some discussion uh, of whether that was true for the commercial banking sector. Okay? So uh, very crudely, you can sort of think of this as the shadow banking sector, or as part of the shadow banking sector. For the commercial banking sector, this is uh, uh, from a recent paper by Hay and co uh, they would argue uh, that it may have gone the other way. Uh, so for commercial banks, actually, there was an uh, uh, increase in leverage during the crisis. Um, now, there may be a number of reasons for that. One of them is also mentioned uh, in the paper. Some people would take on the credit lines. Uh, there was also the fact that a lot of off-balance sheet uh, assets came onto bank balance sheets. Uh, you know, those were also the ones getting most of the government support. Uh, so you may think that's why they could increase leverage. But in some sense, somebody has to hold the assets at the end of the day. And uh, typically, the financial sector continues to hold them. So there was a reallocation, potentially, in the financial sector towards uh, the regulated sector, towards the commercial banks. So uh, the picture is a little bit more nuanced once we think about uh, leverage. So in terms of thinking about uh, financial sector leverage, uh, I would sort of distinguish more between broker dealers, hedge funds, maybe other parts of the shadow banking system, which seem to have delivered, and commercial banks, which seem to have expanded the balance sheet. There's some discussion of that in the paper, uh, but I think it would be nice to sort of tie it to the predictions coming out of the model, which right now only focus on them being pro-cyclical, which is sort of true for the shadow banking part, but it's not clear whether that's true for the financial sector of all. So tying these uh, um, uh, estimates from the paper to, to what we have observed during the crisis, I think, would be uh, useful. Uh, so let me just conclude. I think this paper asks an interesting and topical question. I think it's very important to sort of bring money back uh, and bring banks into these models, trying to understand whether they can help us uh, explain uh, real outcomes and help us to do better policy. I think my main comments is being a little bit clear of what's the main friction they want to put in. Uh, I'd like to see more 
about the implications of the deposit funding, in particular sort of taking the literature on, on deposit seriously and thinking about how it affects liquidity premium, how it affects uh, bank lending, uh, and then I'd like to learn a little bit more about uh, the implications with respect to prosecutorial leverage. Let me start with the first, uh, uh, one of the first things that you said is that there's a lot of stuff in the model um, and you want to understand what is, what is really the critical part. The way I constructed this exercise is to start with a model that already has a few things inside but that is already well known, which is Cristiano Motorostano or something in that family of models and then change nothing except one thing which is this uh, di difference in the budget constraint where I collapse the borrower and lender, uh, the depositor and the borrower, into one representative household. That was the nature of the exercise. So in that sense, I already started with a model that had quite a few things inside, but that is at least well known in the literature and it's known what kind of properties it has. Um, I think for an academic exercise, um, it, it might make sense to strip it down even further and, and that's something we're engaged in. Um, um, so, so um, watch this space, I guess. Uh, we'll, we'll be working on that. Um, the, um, the other comment that I found uh, uh, quite important is deposits are special, and there's this, this notion of uh, switching between uh, different types of deposits, uh, the whole, having to switch to the wholesale market during certain times, etc and understanding uh, how that matters, how these different, uh, having recourse to different types of deposit mat deposits matters. Um, I want to first of all explain that in this model, deposits are everything except equity. Um, and I therefore think of bank deposits very, very broadly as representing anything that has at least some sort of liquidity. Because, and, and sort of like Gary Gorton's uh, uh, safe information insensitive financial assets. They all have a little bit of a liquidity premium, although at the margin it may be very, very small because it's issued by a bank. It is therefore held to be uh, safe uh, in varying degrees. Of course, the liquidity premium for transactions balances is going to be particularly high, the difference there to the risk-free rate. But even a lot of other bank liabilities have that difference. And therefore, in line with sort of typical divisia indices of money, I would call all of that an aggregate of money. Which is not to say that it wouldn't be extremely interesting, and it's part of our research agenda, to break that down into at least two classes. And I think what you were getting at um, is uh, a wholesale market and, 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 and more of a retail market. And so you could think of that as one uh, high-velocity, low-interest type of deposit and another low-velocity, high-interest type of money with different people who are willing to hold that. And what if there are preferences, uh, switches in preferences between these two different deposit classes, etc. Nothing, by the way, changes anything about the way of money, uh, about the channels for money creation and balance sheet creation that I talked about in the paper of today. But it adds a very, very interesting and highly policy-relevant angle to it. And that's actually part of my future uh, research agenda. Um, for pro-cyclical leverage, I should briefly explain what is already in the paper. Uh, you alluded to the fact that, that at least something is there, and that is uh, uh, lags of output. When you look at pro-cyclicality, you're, um, you're uh, looking at the um, um, correlation between um, leverage and the trended output. Um, and so what we did is we included lags of output um, in that exercise, and we found that uh, leverage was pro-cyclical if you, if, uh, across five or six different banking systems, so not just the United States, also several European ones. It was pro-cyclical when you include uh, at least four quarters of lags of output. At the fourth quarter, it becomes pro-cyclical almost across the board, not always statistically significant. And the reason is um, twofold. One is pre-committed credit lines. That's really something that happened uh, during the financial crisis where the banks wanted to uh, reduce the size of their balance sheet and their leverage, but their borrowers had access to legally pre-committed credit lines that they could draw down. And in fact, those borrowers ended up doing something that's almost exactly like in the model with the representative agent. They simultaneously borrowed and then held that liquidity on their balance sheet. They simultaneously held those two positions because that liquidity was at a premium during the crisis, right? 
And, and that's what they did, but only up to the point where those credit lines could be renegotiated, and, and then they were cut, you know, in most cases. Um, the other thing um, that is relevant here, and this goes back to my experience as a banker, you know, you have a big portfolio of customers out there with whom you uh, uh, agreed on certain credit lines, and you don't just willy-nilly change that from, uh, from, and it's not just to do with legally pre-committed credit lines. You have a customer relationship. And so um, it takes time until you have your other, your, your next review meeting. It might be every six months or every 12 months that you have a review meeting when you then change the facilities. It is, there's, there's some administrative work involved in doing that. And that is why when you look at the data contemporaneously, uh, you will not necessarily observe that when there's a big crash that, uh, that immediately all those credit lines go, go down. Um, but uh, after the banks have, time, have had time to review all their accounts, which I would guess takes about a year, then, um, then, then you will observe that. There may be other things that are relevant to leverage, and I'm quite, uh, quite happy to look into this. There's also the issue of whether you want to look at book value leverage and, and market leverage, market value leverage. Um, these, are, these are things that we keep looking into. In fact, at the Bank of England, we, we have one project uh, on the agenda where we want to look at this uh, um, uh, in, a, in a much, much bigger cross-section of countries. So a lot of your suggestions can be taken on board once we do that work. So that's... that's uh, um, yeah. and it seems that it's missing from this picture is that banks do have to clear uh, these payments so there's a liquidity cost present in that operation that could potentially be a constraint on how much they want to lend it's a soft constraint but it does impose a shallow cost in the, in, in the expansion of deposits yeah uh, the reason why I left that out of the model is that during normal times uh, this is a this is a constraint that does not work via quantities only via prices. Right? If you have to hold, if you have to hold some uh, interbank liquidity, some reserves in order to clear your payments, and they pay very low interest rate, there will be some price effects of that. But when you are in a functioning inflation targeting regime where the central bank targets an interest rate, it has to basically supply as many reserves as the banks want at that rate, and it will. When you're looking at, uh, when you, and, and there are, in fact, they're cited in the paper, there are many, many central bank documents that were published in some cases prior to the crisis, even after the crisis, they'd say exactly what I just said. So reserves are endogenous during those normal times, and therefore we have left them out of the model entirely. I totally agree with you. I, I'm a fan of your paper. Uh, I totally agree with you that there, there, there can be times when that is not the case and that there are interesting extensions of our model uh, that, would, that would be very useful to do, and I'm keen to do them. So I want to make two points. The first one is that I, perhaps that the two models are not so far apart as one thinks, because uh, if I'm a bank and I give you a mortgage, and I give you a mortgage, let's say, of a half a million dollars, at the same time, I give you credit, so I create assets and liabilities on, at the same time. But at the end of the day, you, you took this mortgage because you want to buy a house, and then you give this $1 million, which are the deposits, to somebody else. So you have to find somebody. So the sequencing is different, but at the end of the day, there has to be somebody who holds on this $1 million or half a million dollars in deposits with me. So this guy is essentially lending to you through me uh, this money. So these two models or the two setups might not be so uh, different once you take the whole transaction into account that actually somebody wants to then with deposits buy something and it passes on to somebody else. The second point I just want to echo was was mentioned before is that that leverage is, is a very difficult animal to, uh, to measure, in particular if you look market values or book values. But I think one thing one should keep in mind, if the banking sector gets into difficulties, in such a, to such an extent that the, the equity value goes to zero, leverage goes by definition to infinity. Okay, so often there are measurement issues because you don't take into account that actually the market value is actually going close to zero and the book value is still stuck at some old levels. So I think, and I totally agree with what Philip said, I think while for the shadow banking sector it's very, very much prosecutable for the traditional banking sector, it's the, I think it's the other way around. But there's still the profession is sorting this out. There's some dispute in, in the literature on that. Thank you.
Yeah, I think the second point, uh, I, I sort of already partly uh, answered that in the previous uh, um, uh, answer. Uh, your first example is, um, to me, uh, that's not the end of the story, right? So, okay, I get a mortgage, and then I pay somebody, and then that somebody is going to be a depositor somewhere in the banking system. Let me give you another example. I'm a firm. I want to expand my uh, production. And I go to the, uh, the bank, and it gives me a loan, and I then start to employ, employ more workers to produce more stuff, and I pay my workers. Uh, the workers then are going to be ending up uh, with that money that I borrowed, right? But the workers are then going to buy products, including my products, in which case the money comes back to me. And in fact, if the bank is expanding credit to the firm, it might also, if it's a generalized lending boom, it might also be expanding credit to workers, which is the second reason why the workers might then buy my stuff, and the money comes back to me. What this example makes clear is that we shouldn't think of this as a one transaction thing when money is created. It's a circulating medium of exchange. I lose it, I get it back, it is circulating all the time, but when there is more circulating, uh, this has a macroeconomic effect. When you look at the balance sheet dynamics of money center banks, uh, and then we can also talk about shadow banks, um, a big driver of uh, the creation of money through making loans and then uh, the deposits on the other side of the balance sheet, as you pointed out, was equity, right? So that if market values of assets go through a step function change, depending upon the lever leverage ratio of banks, you're, you're gonna have to cut back, as you point out, to bring your ratios in alignment with your regulatory requirements, right? Okay, there are a number of other factors that are affecting the equity account besides uh, asset values that are looming large for money center banks right now. And I don't know whether or not, when you aggregate them, they make a difference in the modeling. And it could be a transitory thing. But this is, seems to be a, a, a feature of the post-2008 landscape. And that is litigation. So one money center bank, a worldwide bank, just mentioned to us in a meeting that every time they raise equity, a New York State Attorney General comes to them and says, we want our share because you engaged in bad practices. So they take a big chunk of it as part of a settlement. So that's number one. So there's a lot of litigation, whether it's the government or uh, private actions for, you know, and this is time lags, time delays from underwriting of residential mortgage-backed securities and the chain of liability that is being assessed through the courts, right? So there's contingent liabilities that affect the equity account, plus um, in the private sector and also the government. So that's number one. Number two, um, the capital requirements are a moving target also, right? You know, and you see this in Europe. You know, we're gonna increase uh, the, re the capital equity requirements, which then affect the rest of the balance sheet. Or are we gonna be more lenient because uh, we find that we're not generating enough growth in Europe? So to some extent, when banks plan uh, how much they want to lend out, there's no certainty right now in this current environment as to what that equity is going to be. So you have those two uncertainties, whether they loom large in the modeling, I'm not exactly sure. Um, the other thing I want to say is that um, the asset value issue the value of assets gets affected by a lot of different things. And it usually, it, what we find when we invest, it's, just as, it's not just the plumbing of the system, it's the perception of what's going on in the market, right? So for, or a combination of the two. So if the Fed says, if you look at it in terms of three balance sheets, money center banks, excuse me, central banks, money center banks, and shadow banks that interact with each other dynamically, if the central, if the if uh, the Fed says I'm no longer in an expansive mode, and the dollar goes up in value, it's a tightening of the system before the Fed acts, and then that ripples through, particularly the shadow banks, 
which then affects asset values, which then affects bank values. One last thing I would say is that money center banks being regulated uh, significantly are trying to find leverageable asset classes that are less regulated, in the, whether it's currency or commodities. And when there are fundamentals that shift in these assets, there's a deleveraging effect going on. And to the extent that money center banks have been regulated out of the dealer community, their inventories where the intermediate proce prices are le they're less there to buffer prices, the step function changes in those assets, like commodities, oil, causes an unwinding effect that then affects asset values, which then affects loan values, that then affects the bank's lending at the most senior level. So these are a lot of effects that at least that we're seeing. Again, whether they make a difference in the aggregation issues that you point out in the models, I'm not exactly sure. I just wanted to point out some of the observations that we've seen as a small member of the shadow banking system, that being a hedge fund. Yeah. No, I, I think uh, I can't comment on the litigation part. Uh, the fact that capital requirements are a moving target obviously uh, matters a great deal um, because you can, you can um, uh, meet the capital requirements by raising the capital or by deleveraging, right? And so you could actually, we have never done this with this particular model, but you could, you could have a model solution whereby if you suddenly re raise uh, capital requirements, the banks would initially certainly meet that by deleveraging, and that would not be macroeconomically a very um, favorable outcome. So if you do want to introduce them as per this model, I'm not saying anything about policy here, right, uh, then, uh, then you would have to do it gradually, if at all, right, uh, once, you have, once, you, once you have determined what, what is a long-term good level of capital requirements. Um, uh, some of the other things that... Um, uh, you said, remind me, or are related to uh, something that the discussant said, you know, how about the wholesale market versus the real retail market, you say, how about the shadow banks versus the commercial banks and these ripple effects, etc. I think all of these effects are extremely interesting um, because I think there is a qualitative difference between the wholesale and the retail funding market. Doesn't change my basic argument, though. There is a qualitative difference between shadow banks and commercial banks, doesn't change my basic argument for the commercial banks, but the shadow banks are actually intermediaries. The shadow banks are uh, uh, actors that have to attract funds before they can lend them out. They cannot create funds. Um, and so the interaction between those two different types of financial institutions is also very interesting as a, a part of the future research agenda. Can everybody hear this? That the ECB has been providing to the European banks, we see it, right? Uh, when, uh, because they're so m much more dependent on large brokered deposits and money market funds. And that role of the central banks, uh, particularly in Europe, does affect that funding role is important. So the, you know, the standby facilities, the LTR facilities, LTRO facilities, aren't they important? I mean, the banks in Europe are in a position right now where they can't create money in the way you say, making loans to companies and then they show up as deposit. When they're so dependent on the ebb and flow of money market funds to fund their liabilities and, you know, versus the United States. Uh, yes, but the only thing I want to say about that, and I'm not, I'm not sure whether that was implicit w in what you were saying, that there is a very common misunderstanding out there that uh, when central banks lend funds to banks, uh, that banks can lend those funds out. Right? That, that is a very common... I'm, I'm not... I'm talking about refinancing their existing... Uh, refinancing, yeah. Because it, uh, what is very important uh, to, to remember is we do have a split circulation system. We have, re and, and that was implicit in Martin Schneider's uh, work this morning. Um, and those two circulations do not intersect in the sense that if the central bank lends money uh, to commercial banks, if it were to lend fresh money to commercial banks, there is nothing that the commercial banks can do that with that in aggregate, rather than uh, other than sitting on it. 
uh, they cannot lend it out to non-banks because non-banks do not have an account at the central bank, right? Um, so this is, may not be answering your questions, but I, uh, question, but I thought it was important to mention this because it is a very, impo uh, very important misunderstanding that floats around out there.